Okay, uh, welcome back to the Simulation Summer School 2021. Uh, thanks for thanks for watching. I'm really delighted uh, to be uh, joined here by Vimal Rao, who's going to be taking us through simulation designs for ANOVA, and it sounds like an absolutely fascinating um, session. Um, Vimal is a, uh, a PhD candidate at the University of Michigan, uh, looking at educational psychology, um, and is also uh, has a huge statistics and maths background, which is like, excellent news for for, for, the, for the summer school. Um, and I guess I'll just pass over, over to Ron now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, that is the wrong screen that I wanted to be sharing. Let me try that again. Uh, <laughs> here we go. Okay, uh, and thank you very much. It's Minnesota, not Michigan, although we are very close to each other. So, um, but it's my pleasure to be sharing uh, today with you my approach that I use uh, in teaching and also advising and mentoring uh, my students uh, who are in educational psychology and my colleagues for how to do simulation-based inference when we uh, are analyzing data from psychological experiments, most often uh, those utilizing ANOVA design. So we'll talk about uh, all of that in a second. Uh, this workshop is going to be in three parts. Uh, in the first part, I'll just explain the approach. Uh, there's a three-pronged approach uh, that I think uh, is for all simula uh, simulation-based inference you can use, but then also I think it's useful even if you're not using simulation to do your inference. I think it's a great way to get you thinking about your analyses and the design of your experiments and ultimately your conclusions to help you communicate. In the second part, we'll do an activity. This will just be individual, but we'll apply the approach to a fraction intervention study. Uh, this is uh, real data, uh, and that's where uh, some of the R code that uh, I've shared with the repository will come into play. Uh, and then in the very last part, we'll do an exercise in small groups. So for that last part, if you're able and willing, please do uh, turn on your cameras and your microphones. We'll split up into groups of three or four, and we'll apply this three-pronged approach to some seminal studies from the field of psychology. There's a couple of assumptions that I'm making about things that you know. So I'm assuming that you're familiar with experimental design and random assignment, or at least its purpose. In an experiment, we're trying to establish some causal effect. And we're unsure whether or not it's the different exposure to the treatments uh, that we have exposed our participants to that is causing some difference in uh, some variable that we're measuring, or if there's some other sources of those differences, like confounding variables. And we want to utilize random assignment. Uh, then we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, but that helps us quantify our uncertainty as to whether or not our treatments were actually the cause of these differences or if there are other things. Related to that, hopefully you're familiar with statistical tests and null hypotheses and p-values. Whatever your thoughts are about null hypotheses and p-values, uh, no matter what school of statistics you subscribe to, when you're conducting a test, you have to compare uh, probabilistic expectations based on a hypothesis to some observed evidence. And that comparison, it uh, spans all of the different schools of statistics. And really what we're talking about today is a way to think about how we form those probabilistic expectations. What are those probability distributions and where do they come from? And so hopefully you're familiar, you've thought about that a little bit, you've taken a stats class. Uh, I'm also assuming you know just a little bit about R. You've opened it up before, you have used the LM function for linear models, you know how to specify a model equation there, response variable, tilde, explanatory variable one, plus covariate one, things like that. Uh, and then also that you've heard of ANOVA before, the analysis of variance, I'll do a quick primer. Uh, but that the basic idea that it's partitioning sources of variance and then it's quantifying the variance uh, from each source with an F statistic. And we'll be utilizing that today. So let's jump into part one. What exactly is this three-pronged approach? Uh, but before we do it, I wanna take a moment to explain why I'm advocating for simulation here, because this is different than using simulation to do a power analysis that's prospective before you've actually conducted your study, or even a simulation study where you have a model that's your object of study and you're using simulation in order to better understand it. Here I'm saying you've done an experiment, you've collected your data, and I still want you to use simulation in order to help you analyze it. There are really two sets of reasons. One is pedagogical and one is practical. I think that this framework allows you to, or forces you to make explicit some things that you don't have to if you're just using the traditional base methods. You know that you've used an ANOVA design. You are going to open up our SPSS and you're gonna select your variables and you're gonna get a p-value. Great, what did you just do? 
what was the process that led to that? So I think you don't have to actually make any of those things explicit. In the simulation-based approach, you have to make those things explicit. And I think there's real value in that, obviously uh, for pedagogical reasons, but for practical reasons, it helps us communicate what we've done. When we go and write our methods section, I think that this approach really sets us up to do that well, to communicate all of the important design considerations that we've made, that you know if we do a slightly different design, we are liable to get slightly different results. And especially in an era of open science, I think it's very important to clearly communicate exactly what we've done, not only in our procedures and our design, but how that informs our analysis, because analysis and design are tied together. Second, I think this, or, or not second, I've lost count now, but I think additionally that this approach is very robust. That when we have complexity in a design, uh, that this approach handles that complexity quite well and quite intuitively. And hopefully you'll get a taste of that. Uh, and finally, practically, there are fewer assumptions with a randomization-based or simulation-based approach to ANOVA than the equation-based approach. Like that normality assumption, that's not a thing anymore. It's we're basing this entirely on a random process. And that alone is basically the single assumption. So it makes it a lot easier. I think it's a ro more robust method. The approach itself is more robust. It has pedagogical value. And I think it helps us actually communicate what we're uh, trying to do. So a quick primer on ANOVA because we're talking about ANOVA-based designs. I'm talking about situations where we have some quantitative response variable and we're comparing averages uh, across multiple groups. So in, psycho in psychology, maybe we have some assessments uh, that we've given to students. We're trying to measure some construct. Uh, these are scores perhaps between like zero and 100, let's just say. And then we have multiple groups because it's an experiment we've randomly assigned uh, individuals, participants, two groups, and we've exposed them to different things. Maybe we've given one group a training that we think will lead to higher scores on average uh, than another group, and we want to compare scores between these groups. But we uh, start by accepting that there's individual variability. Each of our participants are different individuals. Even if we expose them all to the same thing, they're not all going to get the same score on this outcome variable right? They're going to score different things. And that's fine. And we accept that. But now, how do we determine whether or not people are getting different scores just because people are different, or because our exposure actually had an effect? ANOVA seeks to partition variance in the response variable into basically or these different sources, the individual variability that exists in all of the different groups, uh, from the variability between the different groups, and in our case with an experiment that are the cause of this difference in exposure. For our purposes, randomization is key. Even in the equation-based methods, if you go back and read, for example, Ari Fisher's 1925 book, The Statistical Methods for Research Workers, he talks about the importance of randomization underlying all of this. And, and we'll see why randomization is so important uh, coming up. If you don't have a random process, you actually, it doesn't really make sense to, to get a p-value at all. Um, okay, so now, without further ado, what is this three-pronged approach that I've mentioned a couple times? Uh, step one is draw a study design diagram. This tells a story of what's happening to your participants. So it's the things that we would normally put in like our participant section or uh, maybe some of the procedure section of our method sections of our papers. Next, we're going to specify a hypothesized data generating process. This is really important. Um, this is really, I think, the link between the, the study design diagram and eventually doing a statistical test. And this is where a null hypothesis comes in. But a null hypothesis saying, oh, there is no effect, that's useless. In and of itself, that's not statistically testable. A statistically testable hypothesis then has to specify, uh, lead to the specification of a sampling distribution. A hypothesized data generating process seizes upon our uh, design diagram that we just drew and says, okay, here are all the sources of variation or the potential sources of variation for our response variable. And let's make a claim about what actually is contributing variance and what isn't. And then we can go and test that. And we will test it by enacting simulation uh, based on this null data generating process, utilizing R, and I'll be utilizing the mosaic package here today. So we'll do all three of these things. Again, R is, it comes into play. Uh, we'll practice that a little bit, but really if you draw the design diagram well, you are able to specify a data generating process, then hopefully the R comes relatively intuitively thereafter. 
So let's talk about design diagrams a little bit more. Here's an example of one. Uh, I wouldn't say that it's perfect. It's from a study by Bandura, Ross and Ross in 1961. And we can see a couple of things. There were 72 children that they had as participants. They split them up into three different groups, uh, a control condition, there was an aggressive role model and a non-aggressive role model. Uh, and then furthermore, they were, uh, there was a male model and a female model. And then they even uh, stratify the participants based on their own gender themselves. So uh, we can see kind of the story of what happened in this study. And that's the purpose of the design diagram. I think there's a, a couple things that you should always include. Um, start with what's your population of interest? What are your inclusion and exclusion criteria? Uh, for experiments, we're typically just recruiting people, right? We're more interested in the causal claims that we're making. So you know, we can forgive leaving this out if we're trying to mimic uh, random sampling or we're trying to make estimates uh, for population parameters, this would be very important to include. Uh, but then once we specify our population of interest, what's our sample and what was our sampling strategy? How do we get these people? So in this Bandura at uh, all example, we just start with a sample It's 72 children. How do we get them? They were volunteers essentially. And I think that uh, just specifying that at the very least is sufficient when we're talking about experiments. Next, what are the experimental groups that we have and how did we assign people to groups? So we see here there's three groups, the 72 children got split up immediately. How were they split up? It would be important to denote that. It's not obvious here in this diagram, actually, this was um, a matched pairs design or a matched triad design. You can't really tell right now. So we'll actually do an example of not of this Bender et al. study, but a 1963 study. And, uh, and we'll see why including information about how people were split up is actually really important when we later come to specifying a data generating process and then actually doing our inference. So what are the groups that we have and how have we split them up? That's very important. Finally, what are you measuring and when are you measuring it? So this is also not in this design diagram. Uh, in order to do the matching, there was a, a rating of children's aggression that was done here. And then finally, there's an outcome variable. They measured students' aggressive behavior towards these dolls. So including the measurements in this diagram is really important because uh, especially when we talk about the differential exposure effects, it will make a big difference whether or not something was measured before children were randomly assigned or participants were randomly assigned or if the measurement was taken afterwards. And this now is a temporal account of the entire study. That's the goal of the design diagram. So either top to bottom or left to right, it's telling you all of the important information of what was done. How did you split people up? What were they exposed to differentially at the very least? And what are you measuring and when? And if you include those three things, those are the nuts and bolts of a design diagram. And that really sets you up to do the next step well which is a data generating process, a hypothetical one, maybe the null data generating process. But in this step, we're asked to consider the sources of variation in the response variable. So Bandura et al, they were talking about aggressive behavior. What are sources of variation? Well, one is measurement variability. We can't escape that, especially in the psychological sciences, right? We're hoping that our measures have very high reliability, but uh, the reliability isn't one, which I've never seen any assessment that done, has done that. We're just hoping that the measurement error doesn't include our ability to talk about individual and group variability. So the next thing is individual variability. These children are all different. Even if we didn't, uh, uh, we just had all 72 children and we gave them dolls and observed their behavior, they would do different things, right? Individual differences lead to individual variability in the response variable. And finally, group variability. So maybe there's something about different groups of children for experimental purposes now, differences in exposure that an entire group was exposed to something like an aggressive role model and a different group wasn't. And now this actually is causing uh, differences in the response variable. So we consider these sources of variation and Furthermore, we consider the way each source affects a sample statistic that we're going to calculate. So now we have to decide what's the sample statistic that we want to calculate. For ANOVA designs, this is going to be the F statistic. Why the F statistic, again, it quantifies the uh, variation due to a particular source when we have multiple sources. So again, I'm not gonna get into it more here, but we'll talk about the F statistic today at the very least. So what is contributing to the estimate of an F statistic within a sample? Well, one is differential exposure. So if we have these multiple uh, experimental conditions and we're talking about uh, 
eventually the average, uh, the aggressive behavior, then on average, the children who uh, saw the aggressive role model may uh, have ex uh, exhibited more aggressive behavior than those who didn't. That would be a between group difference, right? So now this is the source of variation here is this experimental condition, that group. So that's one way that the experimental source can affect the sample statistic, that F statistic. Another is covariates and controlled for confounders, basically background differences. So if we took you know, measurements of students' aggressive behavior at the start of the study, we said individual differences are gonna play in here. So let's account for that. The children themselves are, are different. And so these individual differences are still going to lead to um, the, the estimate of different sample statistics because it's going to affect their responses. Uh, and then finally, random sources of error. This is particularly important. Random assignment, uh, if we've used in the studies, we've split up uh, these 72 children into three different groups. And let's assume for a moment that uh, the conditions didn't have any effect. We're still calculating means essentially for all 24 of the children exposed to the aggressive role model condition and all 24 for the non-aggressive role model and then comparing them. But if there's no difference in exposure, then it was just a coincidence in the way we split the kids up that's allowing that one child to contribute to that one group's mean. We could redo the study and split them up in a different way. And again, there's no difference in the, there's no exposure effect according to the null hypothesis at the very least. And so we would get a different mean, not because any exposure has changed, just because we randomly assigned different groups of children to the different groups. That would be a random source of error. And this is particularly important. That is the entire mechanism of this randomization-based simulation approach to ANOVA. And so what's the null hypothesis that you want to test? I kind of just previewed that for you. In an experiment, there's some differential effect that we're testing. And the null hypothesis will be that there's no differential effect. If there was no different differential effect, no matter what group children were assigned to, they still would have ended up exhibiting the same uh, outcome that we measured and that we observed. So these six boys are the female model and the aggressive role model condition. If the aggressive role model didn't actually do anything to help determine their behavior at the end of the study, then if those same six boys happened to have been assigned to the non-aggressive role model condition uh, with a female model, they would have done the same thing because the non-aggressive role model or the aggressive role model under this null hypothesis had no effect, exhibited no effect on what they ultimately did. So we could mimic reshuffling them up in order to see what type of variation we get when we calculate these between group differences because this null hypothesis says that this experimental source of variation is inconsequential. And that's what we'll actually be doing. It says you could shuffle these people up. You would have gotten the same individual responses, but what you would have calculated would have been different. If you're familiar with the equations, the one way in NOVA model, uh, it says that individuals' responses are a function of some grand mean plus some treatment effect and then residuals. This null hypothesis says there's no treatment effect. It's just the grand mean. But we're still calculating means for each group. Each group, it, it, there's no effect. What group you belong to didn't have an effect on what you actually did, your observed response variable, according to the null hypothesis. And so the variation due to treatment effect, it's just coincidental. And we can shuffle people up and calculate those differences between means and see what we would have gotten under this null hypothesis. And that's exactly what we'll do with R. We've specified a model based on the design diagram. Uh, this is the null hypothesis uh, data generating process, null DGP. Uh, my vocabulary isn't perfectly consistent, I apologize. But it basically says that we could shuffle this experimental source of variation that the DGP claims is inconsequential. We assign groups, we randomly assign groups, we can reassign them. We were in control of that. And randomization allows us to do this. So once we've chosen a sample statistic, again, in our case, it's the F statistic, we can now shuffle, calculate what the F statistic would be in all of these reshufflings, do this many times, and now we have expectations for what the F statistic should be if this null hypothesis is correct. That's a sampling distribution. And now we have a sampling distribution, we can obtain a p-value. 
So what's the difference between this approach and maybe one that you've been taught? Well, instead of using equations to get the sampling distribution, we're going to seize upon this fact that we've randomly assigned people. We've specified this data generating process. We're claiming that the experimental uh, source of variation is inconsequential. So then we're reassigning, reallocating, re-randomizing participants in order to see what we might get typically uh, for uh, in, in a scenario where the null hypothesis is true. Okay, so that's the, the end of part one. We're going to practice this three-step approach now over the next half hour. And we're gonna take a, a short break in a couple minutes. Before we do, uh, you need to do a little bit of setup. So there's two libraries that you have to have, uh, Tidyverse and the Mosaic uh, libraries or packages. Um, there's a GitHub page associated with this. Uh, if you click on clone, uh, as Ollie said, that you can download. Um, all of the files, there's a CSV file. That's the data set that we're gonna be working with. I'll introduce that in a second. There's also an R markdown file that you can open and an HTML file. There are some diagrams that my understanding is they don't load properly. So I apologize for that. Um, but if you go and visit this link, we'll paste it in the chat in a second, download that CSV file, make sure that you can read it in. And there's code to read it in actually in that R markdown file. So if you wanna follow along with that R markdown file, you'll be able to uh, complete all of these steps. So we'll paste that link in a second. Uh, the data set that we're gonna be using for the next half hour, this is a real data set from a real study. Uh, there's some more information in running it all 2021. That's uh, a poster that was uh, presented at the National Association of School Psychologists annual meeting earlier this year, uh, national in reference to the United States. Uh, there is a paper that has just been submitted. So hopefully that will be out soon. And that has way more information about the study design and all of the measures. But the uh, short of it is that this is a class-wide fraction intervention study. We had 114 fourth grade students who were all volunteers. We randomly assigned them to one of three experimental conditions. And the experiment was to investigate the effect of instructional sequences on their conceptual understanding. So what were those three different experimental conditions? One was a concepts first instructional sequence. So over the course of 12 lessons, the first Six were all focused on developing conceptual understanding. The latter six were all focused on developing procedural fluency. That was the concept's first condition. The iterative condition then uh, started with a procedural fluency and then conceptual understanding, procedural fluency, conceptual understanding, and back and forth for the 12 lessons. And there was also a control group. So we have three experimental conditions, control, concepts first, iterative. Uh, and today we're going to analyze the conceptual understanding of the standard notion of math models. This was not the main outcome variable for the, the full paper, uh, but it'll, it'll suit our purposes today. This was measured via a 10 item assessment and scores go between zero and 20. So that's our response variable that we'll be analyzing. We have 114 participants. They were randomly assigned to three different experimental conditions. So uh, let's take a, a five minute break. It's 1027. Let's come back actually just at 1035. Uh, in that time, uh, try out drawing a design diagram for a one way ANOVA. So this is a simplified design. Our response variable is concept subscore post. The explanatory variable is condition. Again, the simplified design is we have 114 students randomly assigned to three groups of 38 each. The three groups, so the three experimental conditions are concepts first, iterative, and control. This response variable was measured at post-test. So again, how were participants split up? What was measured and when? And then think about specifying a data generating process. What's the null hypothesis? It would be that there was no differential uh, effect in terms of the exposure to the ex instructional sequences, that that had no bearing on the observed uh, response variable scores for each student. So what would that data generating process be? Let's take uh, now again until 1035, uh, it's my 1035, I think it's 235. A 4.35? I don't know what time it is. 35 past the hour. <laughs> yes, that's yeah. Yeah, 25 to 4, uh, 3, yeah. Exactly. 25 okay. to 5. I don't know. I'm, I'm doing it wrong now. <laughs> cool. uh, in, in this indeterminate amount of time, though, boot up R, uh, download the data set, the CSV file, and then uh, try to draw these design diagrams. So we'll see you uh, in about six, seven minutes. Okay, so hopefully that went well. Uh, let's take a look at the design diagram. I apologize for the low quality of this drawing. This has been done in paint because I need to still yet learn a better drawing software. But we started with 114 students recruited. They were split up into three groups. The concepts first group, the iterative group, and the control group were the, the condition 
uh, how was it split up or how were they split up via random assignment? So um, I haven't included that actually like in these arrows here, but I prefer just to um, kind of point to the, the act of splitting it up with a separate arrow. Uh, now, once they are in each of their groups, they get exposed to an instructional sequence. I also don't kind of include that in line. I think it's relatively obvious that the students who were put into the concepts first group are going to receive the concepts first instruction. So again, I, uh, I still wanna mark that on the design diagram because I think it's an important part of the temporal sequence of the study, uh, but they get exposed to their different instructional sequence and then they are measured. Now I um, include essentially a different line because I wanna track a single student. So let's talk about a single student. This is Ellen. Uh, who Ellen was randomly assigned to the iterative condition. So Ellen was one of 114 students and then was randomly assigned to the iterative condition. Ellen then got exposed to the iterative instructional sequence and then completed a post-test. On this post-test, Ellen scored 16 out of 20. So now, what is our null data generating process? Well, it says that Ellen always was going to score 16 out of 20 because this instructional sequence, this exposure, there were no differential effects. So you got sent into the iterative condition and got exposed to something. You, if you had gotten sent to the control condition, you would have essentially been exposed to the same thing in terms of an effect on what you would have scored. So Alan right now is contributing, her score of 16 is contributing to the group mean for the iterative condition. But if we happened to assign her to the concepts first condition, her score of 16 would have contributed to the concepts first mean. If we happened to assign her to the control condition, her score of 16 would have contributed to that mean. She always was going to get a 16 because again, there's no differential exposure. That's the null hypothesis data journaling process. So now the group means are really just, or any differences between the group means are a coincidence based on the fact that we randomly assigned people. We split up these 114 kids into 38. There are many ways, I didn't actually calculate the number of permutations, but there are many, many ways to actually affect that split. And so this, what we've observed according to this null data generating process is one a coincidental instance of this. So what do we need to do in R? Well, uh, this is what our model will look like. Hopefully this is familiar to you. Uh, you would, we would use LM. This is our uh, response variable, concept subscore post. We are specifying the condition as an explanatory variable, but we just said condition actually doesn't matter. Uh, if we could shuffle people up again and their scores would stay the same. Ellen's score is still going to be a 16, no matter what condition we assigned her to. And so we can reassign everybody, including Ellen. We can shuffle them up and now calculate the difference in means in order to get an idea of what uh, the between group effect would be according to this uh, null data generating process. So let's uh, jump into R. Uh, I'm actually going to, uh, this is the R markdown file. Uh, and so hopefully you're seeing this uh, generating a sampling distribution. Uh, okay, and so I'm gonna gloss over this really quickly because you have this code, um, but we're using the LM linear model function. We specify a data set. The data set, uh, the name I've given it is fraction.intervention. My screen sharing is paused for some reason. Resume share. Okay, now you can see it. Okay, sorry about that. Um, we have a response variable, concept subscore post, and we're saying that variation is due to condition. So this is probably what you would, uh, you know to do already. And uh, I like type three sums of squares. I'm not going to get into that. Uh, but then here is the F statistic for the condition variable. So this is what we want to extract, right? This is a, the sample statistic that quantifies the extent to which group differences are uh, explaining essentially a variation in the response variable. So we want to extract that. Uh, and then um, we said that, uh, well, we can do this in one line of code. So in that summary table, we can grab all the values from the F value column. This is in the second row. So now uh, this line of code essentially just explains how to extract just this one number. Uh, 
And now we want to shuffle condition. So we said again, according to the null data generating process that condition doesn't matter. Student scores were always going to be what they were. Our estimate of the group differences is really just a coincidence based on the way we happened to randomize them. We can re-randomize and then get a picture of this. So let's shuffle up condition. That's the only change to the code. Uh, the shuffle function is from the mosaic package. Uh, and I think it's relatively intuitive. We do the same things in order to extract that one F statistic. So if we shuffle everybody up, uh, here's the F statistic from that shuffled or re-randomized uh, simulation uh, trial. Okay. So we want to do this many, many times. Uh, we're going to do it 10,000 times. We need to condense this extraction of the single F statistic into one line of code. So that's uh, just kind of inserting the, the second line into the first. And now to do something multiple times from the mosaic package, you write do and how many times you want it done. So we want this extraction, this calculation of an F statistic from a shuffled uh, trial. We want that done 10,000 times. So we say do 10,000. And then we specify our model again with shuffling the condition extracting the F value. And now this creates a data frame with uh, just a single variable that which is called result. And now we can analyze it. So we've already talked through why we're doing this. So we've done this now and here is the result of our 10,000 trials. This is a sampling distribution. This is not going to exactly match the theoretical F distribution with uh, whatever two and uh, 100 and something degrees of freedom, but it, it's doing that same thing basically. And now this forms our expectations of what the F statistic should be according to the null data generating process. If there was no differential effect, then this is, the, this is what we should have calculated because any one of these could have happened. They're all equally plausible because uh, again, the, the source of the between group differences is just actually random variation. We ran, happen to randomly assign people in this way and then this is why it makes it look like there are differences. What we actually observed, the F statistic was one point something. That's right in line with our expectations. So you know, certainly I think that our theory, this null hypothesis theory is consistent with um, our observed uh, evidence here. Uh, let's actually extract a p-value. You can do this with the counter proportion function. Uh, how many of the results are greater than our observed F statistic? Uh, the p-value here is 0.3. And I think all of you will agree, whatever your thoughts are about 0.05, that 0.3 is quite large and certainly is no basis to suggest that this null data generating process is a, is a poor hypothesis for um, exactly what's going on. Okay, so hopefully that's starting to feel uh, a little bit more concrete now. Uh, this is one way Nova, let's do another example. This is now one way and Cova. So I'm adding covariates and I'm also uh, making the design a little bit more complicated. We, we're, we actually didn't do simple random assignment. It was block randomization. Uh, that's actually a lie that I'll change a little bit later, but for now we did block randomization. So it's the same response variable, uh, concept subscore post, we're interested in our experimental conditions, uh, which are the three concepts first, iterative and control groups. The design though, we actually just had five classes of students. Each class had 23, 26, 25, 21, and 19 students each. Um, there's a variable in the data set called class ID. This denotes what class the student were a part of. Within each class, we randomly assign students to conditions. So that's what block randomization is basically. It's saying that you're doing the simple randomization, but you're doing it within each of these blocks or within each of these clusters. And there's some other reason why people are already in these groups. For our case, uh, convenience, I suppose. This is where people were. So we did random assignment within these classes. Let's also add two covariates here. We're talking about a uh, conceptual understanding of fractions. Fractions are rational numbers, right? Uh, but what you know about whole numbers probably is going to influence what you know about rational numbers. The MCAP is an assessment of whole number knowledge. Uh, from, uh, there's a little bit more information on that R Markdown file if you're interested. And when this paper gets published, there will be a lot more information there as well. But for our purposes, MCAP uh, represents students' whole number knowledge. This certainly seems like it's going to be associated with their uh, uh, conceptual understanding of fractions and rational numbers. So let's add that in as a covariate here. And then we also have pretest scores. You might be asking yourself, you have pretest, you have post-test, why isn't this repeated measures? It's because pretest scores were measured before the randomization happened. 
when we talk about repeated measures, we're really talking about multiple measurements that occurred after randomization. Because the pretest scores happened before randomization, they're just another covariate. And this is where it's really important to draw your design diagram model. We're going to put pretest scores. I'm telling you now, it's going to happen before the randomization. Uh, but that just, again, it makes it just the same as any other covariate. Um, if it was afterwards, or for example, if we had both proximal and distal measures, then this would now be repeated measures because both the proximal and distal would have happened after the randomization. So that would qualify as repeated measures. We would have to do some other things. But for now, we have these two covariates, whole number knowledge, pretest scores. We've got our experimental condition. We've got this block design. Our same experimental, we want to, that, that's what we want to know, right? Our null hypothesis is about this, uh, the differential effects of the instructional sequences. And we're talking about variance in the post-test score. So let's take five minutes uh, to draw uh, an updated design diagram and specify a data generating process. Let's reconvene at uh, 51 past the hour. Okay. Let's pick back up. So here is how I would have updated the new design diagram. Again, I apologize for my use of paint. So now, as opposed to all 114 participants at the start of the study being in a single pool, we have five different classes. And I've also included the sample sizes for each. I think that that's really helpful. Um, although uh, I don't see that being done uh, for these types of things on a consistent basis. So. Let's just talk about a single class, class one. There were 23 students. The first thing we did is we gave them this whole number test and the pretest. And then in class one, we split them up via random assignment to the concepts first iterative and control conditions. And again, I've, I've noted the sample sizes here. Uh, the reason that I like denoting sample sizes is because when you start to think about who can be shuffled with whom, the sample sizes are really helpful. Okay, so now within class one, these 23 students were split up. Uh, and one thing I wanna notice that within each class, it's not entirely balanced, but one of the nice things about block randomization is overall across all five of the classes, the uh, experimental conditions are all balanced. So each of them do have 38 uh, students, which is a really, really convenient feature of block randomization. Uh, okay, so then uh, after they've been assigned, then they get exposed to the instructional sequence. What's, uh, let's, Think about Ellen again. Uh, what's the null hypothesis say? So Ellen scored a 16 out of 20. She was in class one. She scored, uh, took the MCAP and the pretests, and then was in the iterative condition and ended up getting a 16. The null hypothesis says that the differential, there was no differential exposure. So even if Ellen was sent to the control condition, she still would have gotten a 16. So when we're calculating the means of these groups, at least within class one, that what group that Ellen got sent to would have had no effect. So we can shuffle this around, but we can't shuffle Ellen who was in class one with or into class three's control group. Ellen wasn't a part of class three, Ellen was part of class one. And maybe there's something about the environment of the different classes that does actually have an effect on the post-test scores. Maybe the environment, the learning environment is different. The teacher's presence is different. Maybe the composition of the students is different. There's all kinds of environmental factors, right? The null DGP doesn't say anything about that. It just says that the, there was no differential exposure to instructional sequence. That's the only thing that the null DGP says. So we can only shuffle Ellen with the other students in her class, in class one. So how do we accomplish this? Well, first our model statement, we now have two covariates. So let's add that in the concept subscore post. It's a function of your whole number knowledge and then also your pretest score. Uh, and then also the experimental condition. But we now need to just shuffle Ellen only with other people in her class. How do we do that? Well, we're going to group people by class and then shuffle them. Rather conveniently, the syntax is shuffle condition, but group people by class before you do that. Groups equals class ID, because in class ID has for each student uh, an indicator that says what class they were in. That's the only change that we have to make there. So let's jump into R again. Uh, let me open that up and share my screen. I apologize for this slides delay. Here we go. Okay, 
Uh, so let's scroll back down. One way in COVA with block randomization. This uh, design diagram has all the different classes. Uh, okay, so the syntax is pretty much the same as we saw before. Um, my notation, by the way, it's we had simulated F before. Now we have added covariates and block randomization. So uh, I think everybody uses different idiosyncrasies when trying to balance informative names, but also short names. So we can make typing easier. Um, we're still using do 10,000 because we want to do 10,000 simulations. Uh, we still are using the fraction intervention data set. We have now our model statement, concept subscore. It's a function of the whole number knowledge. Uh, and here it doesn't have the pretest score, but then we're shuffling condition, grouping by class ID. And so this is now what we get for our sampling distribution. Uh, and we can again extract the p-value using the same syntax as above. Uh, in this case, it would be 0.149 or thereabouts. Again, this, I, I would interpret it as the, the, our expectations based on this null data generating process and the observations that we've made and that evidence are consistent with each other, that uh, the evidence falls uh, relatively in line with what we expected to see in terms of the F statistic for between group differences for the experimental condition. So hopefully that was relatively straightforward to you. Um, and this is, uh, let's talk about the real study design and then we're, we're gonna actually do some uh, ex, uh, examples from real papers. Okay, so the real study design was slightly more complicated. Uh, I said that I, I had lied to you, but that I would resolve that. I, I'm not going to lie to you anymore. So the real study design is we had five classes. Uh, so we did block. But then, uh, and we did give students the MCAP and the, the pretest for, uh, but it was conceptual and procedural pretest. There were several. And then within each class, we took students' total scores on all of their pretests and sorted them and then split them into thirds. So there was a top third, a middle third, and a lower third within each class. So this is now a stratification. And the stratification in the thirds, it's inappropriately named, I apologize, but this is in the block ID variable. So each of the thirds has a unique label that is in our data set as block ID. And again, these thirds were created based on their scores on the conceptual and, uh, conceptual and procedural assessments at pretest. Within each third, students were randomly assigned a condition. So this is a block stratified randomization, okay? Uh, after they were uh, randomly assigned, then they were exposed to the instructional sequence and then given a post-test. So what does that look like? Let's just look at class one. So they took the pretest and then they were split. Ellen, uh, let's use her as an example again. Ellen was in the top third of her class. Based on the pretest, Ellen got sent into the top third. And this is where I like denoting exactly how people are split up. These arrows, at least the way that I'm drawing them, there's no difference between splitting up students in the thirds and splitting up students into groups, unless I specify here the manner in which they were split up. A uh, random assignment was only used uh, in splitting them up into conditions, not for splitting them up into these thirds, right? So they're based on their pretest scores, they were split up into these thirds. So Ellen now is in the top third. With the other seven students, so there was eight total in class one in the top third, then these eight students were randomly assigned to concepts first iterative or control group with block randomization again. So it's unbalanced here because there's eight, it's not divisible by three, but across all of the different classes and all of the different thirds, all 15 of them, then we get the equal sample sizes for uh, each of the conditions. So now Ellen was in the top third exposed to the iterative, iterative uh, instructional sequence. And I forgot that arrow, I apologize. And then took the post-test score, got a 16 out of 20. Who can Ellen be shuffled with? The answer is only the other students in her top third of class one. That's where random assignment happened. So she could have been sent to concepts first in the top third, but she was always coming into top third. Cause again, the null hypothesis just says that the exposure effect had no difference. All three of these arrows are the same. It doesn't say anything about the rest of the design. So now we need to shuffle within these thirds within each of the classes. 
Um, there's a question, why did we split into thirds instead of using the pretest value as a covariate as you explained earlier? So we, we know that we wanted to do a stratified design. So we could have just uh, done simple randomification and we had the pretest scores and we could have adjusted later on. But I think when you have a covariate that you know is going to uh, be associated with your response variable, it's best to incorporate that into the design. And so in this case, we instead we could have done like matched pairs or something like that, but we decided to do the stratification because the prospective control of this uh, covariate we felt uh, is just a better design principle. We absolutely could still add that into the model and, and adjust for it, uh, which then uh, I think is an even stronger design and analysis uh, because now we feel even better about the fact that you know the the confounding the potential of a confounding variable is just lower even more it, it, because we utilize random uh, assignment within this stratification. So why not just adjust later? I think because you want everything to be handled uh, prospectively when you can. So if you have known covariates, use them in block stratified randomization. Don't just do simple randomization. But this is maybe just you know how I practice statistics. Um, anyway, uh, so we have these thirds. Again, who can Ellen be shuffled with? Everybody in her third. What's the code look like? pretty much the same as before, only now shuffle condition, but do it within each of these groups. And those groups are these thirds, which is the block ID. So this is the real code that I use to analyze this data set for our study. And I hope, um, and, and we'll see, I suppose, I hope that uh, my argument that this is scalable um, and or, or robust in incorporating uh, complexity in the design in an intuitive way that you're starting to get a feel for that. Again, this three-pronged approach is draw a study design diagram. This is the story of your study. It should capture everything that you're doing. It should uh, have a temporal element. It should talk about who you split up, when you split them up, how you split them up, what did you measure, when did you measure. If you do that well, then specifying a hypothesized data generating uh, process, especially a null DGP, I think is relatively straightforward. Think about who you would shuffle with whom. I think, again, a good design diagram makes that uh, pretty straightforward uh, decision. Uh, and then you can jump into R, utilize the mosaic functions. The sh shuffle uh, function is the key thing here. Uh, to enact a simulation, you get a sampling distribution, and then you can get a p-value. And all of this, I think, demystifies what the heck an F-test is in the first place. And this is part of why I like this for pedagogical reasons, also practical reasons for the communication. And there's no normality assumption. We don't have to do any of that stuff. We did random assignment. We can seize upon that and mimic that with re-randomizing to generate these sampling distributions. End of story, really. OK, so now we're going to transition into part three. Uh, before we do, uh, we'll take uh, another short break, just three minutes this time. Uh, so we'll come back five after, and then we're going to go into groups. So um, after we come back, please, uh, if you are able and willing, uh, consider turning on your video uh, or at the very least your audio. So let's rejoin. Uh, let's make it six after. Really useful way. And so I think uh, both DAGs and the design diagrams are, are similar enough to help get you thinking about what you do want to test and how to test it and you know, different sources of variation. Okay, uh, it's six pass, so let's jump into it. Uh, again, we're about to split up into groups. So what we will be doing in groups is practicing this three-pronged approach. I don't actually have data sets for you, so technically it's only the first two prongs. But I have links, and I will post these in the chat in a second to three uh, different studies. I won't actually explain what they are here, but there's a Steele and Aronson study, a Nisbet and DeCamps uh, Wilson study, and Bandura, Ross, and Ross. Not the one that I talked about earlier, but uh, one a couple years later. Um, what I would like you to do is to read the method sections of these papers and try to draw a design diagram. And then try to specify the null data generating process for these studies. And if possible, write that R syntax. What are you shuffling and how? What's your model statement, including the shuffle? for each of these studies. So uh, we'll split up into groups. Before we do that, let me post uh, these links into the chat. Uh, again, I will post uh, the three different studies uh, for you and then also the links to the Jamboard. So let's, uh, here are Steele and Aronson. That's the paper that's coming to you. Uh, 
you know what, I bet there's a better way to share all these links. Uh, and then let's do the Steel and Aronson Jamboard. So um, if you've never used Jamboards before, basically uh, for each different group that we split you up into, uh, pick a different slide on this Jamboard. So you'll see if you're in group one, go to slide one, and then you can draw here basically. And if you want, you can check out what other people are doing, but, uh, but try to at least work uh, alone as much as possible to practice. Okay, so that's Steel and Aronson. Let's do DeCamp. Uh, Nisbet, uh, Nisbet, okay, there's that, and the Jamboard for Nisbet, and finally, uh, the Bandura paper. So I will say that all three of these studies use different designs uh, than what we've talked about, but hopefully um, what you, you'll be able to draw these design diagrams. And uh, if not, then this is a, a failure in my claim that this is uh, robust. But I think that uh, the idea of thinking through what are the sources of variation uh, and what the null hypothesis then is and, and who can be shuffled with whom, I think you'll be able to do this. So I'll be cycling through the, the breakout rooms as well. Uh, please let me know if you have any questions and then we'll reconvene uh, maybe in about 20 minutes. So at half past, we'll reconvene and talk about it and then close up. Also generate the, uh, the breakout rooms now then. All right, cool. Much easier than uh, than teams pick up rooms. <laughs> sure, yeah, of course. Yeah. Okay. Um. Well, I, I think the rooms are still still just closing in about thirty seconds or so. Um, okay. I'll do some filler talk. So hopefully uh, in doing these examples, uh, and I mentioned this to a couple of people that, uh, you know, even if you aren't going and using uh, R or Mosaic to simulate the F distribution, uh, I think that the data generating process uh, approach to thinking about a null hypothesis and the design diagram that facilitates that are really important uh, to help us think about uh, a study and what the analysis really means and what we're interpreting and what that evidence actually can and cannot say, uh, but then also in terms of reproducibility. So if we wanted to reproduce any one of these studies, if we're able to create the design diagram, we could redo the design, right? Uh, and so that's really important. And I think also then when we're writing ourselves that, uh, that that's particularly helpful to make sure that we're communicating all of the essential pieces of our study design. So let me share with you uh, really quickly how I drew each of these design diagrams. So first is Steele and Aronson. Uh, there wasn't really information about the group sizes, so that's not there, um, but they started with 114 participants. They had as a, a like covariate, uh, they grabbed SAT verbal scores, which were taken before people were even recruited. Uh, and then they grouped individuals by their race and then also by gender. But then I put that in parentheses because they didn't talk about it because they said basically they included gender in a model and it wasn't significant. So they just dropped it. I don't really like that because you planned a study to do this. I would like to see some of that actual evidence, uh, but that's okay. Uh, and then um, what they did was block randomization within each race and presumably within each race gender combination. There were three conditions, the stereotype threat condition, the non-stereotype threat condition, and a challenge condition. So after people were randomized, they got exposed uh, to essentially these prompts and then uh, took a GRE verbal test. So what would the model be in R, or sorry, what's the, the data generating process, the null hypothesis? There's a couple of questions that we could ask, I think. Let's start by uh, the first question that, that's obvious to ask is, are there um, experiments or are there differences in the exposure to each of these three different conditions in terms of the jury of verbal score? So that 
uh, and R, the model statement with GRV verbal scores. We've got some covariates here. So SAT verbal score we think is going to be related. Uh, we think maybe that race is related, possibly gender as well. And then the experimental condition and what can we shuffle or who can we shuffle with whom based on this null data generating process where we're gonna shuffle the condition within really the race and gender uh, blocks. So for all of the black females, they were block, uh, randomized to one of these three conditions. The null hypothesis says that there was no differential effect, so they can all be shuffled together. So if we had some race gender ID, we could shuffle condition grouping by race gender ID. Nisbet and DeCamp Wilson, or just Nisbet and Wilson, um, they actually don't say how they split people up. I'm presuming that it was via random allocation. Otherwise, we should not make any causal inferences here for reasons I hope that are, are obvious. But they started with 118 students. They did this uh, filler interview that everybody watched this video uh, that was a filler. Uh, they all watched the same one. And then presumably they were randomly assigned to either the likable teacher video or the unlikable teacher video group. They watched those videos and then they gave likability ratings. So likability ratings is one response. If we just stop there, let me turn on my uh, spotlight. So if we just think about stopping with the likability ratings, this is a pretty simple one-way ANOVA study, right? And so hopefully it's very clear that if we're analyzing likability ratings, we've re presumably randomly as assigned people to the likable teacher or the unlikable teacher video group. And we can shuffle people essentially uh, shuffle the condition. There's no grouping at all either. And we're analyzing likability ratings as a function of this condition. Uh, but the study goes on. So after that, they were split again uh, and received two different question prompts, uh, whether likability affected appearance ratings or the appearance ratings affected their likability ratings. And this was done again, presumably within each of the likable uh, teacher video and the unlikable teacher video group. And again, presumably via random allocation. That's not explicitly stated anywhere. So now if we were to analyze responses to this final question, what would that, okay, the, a question order null hypothesis be? Well, it's that the question order didn't make a difference. So only this arrow, that exposure was the same. So we would have to group people by their likable teacher, unlikable teacher condition first. Uh, likability rating basically becomes a covariate. And then we could see whether group one and group two are different and group three and group four are different. So that would be, uh, we're gonna shuffle the question order group, but we're having to group by then the, uh, the likable teacher uh, assignment as well. Uh, Bandura, Ross, and Ross, and I don't know if anybody got there, uh, they basically didn't give you anywhere near enough information that you actually need. So if you read the methods section, they start by describing their four experimental conditions. Uh, they have a real life aggressive model, a video of a real life aggressive model, a cartoon aggressive model, and this should say control. I apparently think control and cartoon are too similar words to differentiate. Okay, so we have a control group and three experimental conditions. For the real life model and the video of the real life model, they were also further split into a male model and a female model. And then they say, so this was all done via random allocation, but then they say that they did matched pairs. Uh, and this doesn't, they don't really say enough about how they did this um, or when the matching was done. It presumably when you're doing match pairs, you do this before you assign people, right? So you, you measure all of your uh, 96 uh, participants here on some nursery aggression ratings. And then they use these nursery aggression ratings to match people by split them up by the child's gender first. So we have 48 boys and there's four experimental conditions. So really these are matched quartets. So based on the nursery aggression ratings, there were, I think, 12 groups of four boys all matched together. Kind of like the stratified design with the thirds that I did for the, the running at all study, but now there's just like more groups. Um, and then presumably each one of the four children in one of these matched quartets were assigned to one of these experimental conditions. Only that kind of doesn't make sense. Maybe they were matched like sextets because you've got the male and female model for the real life regression and the male and female video. So I'm not sure this detail wasn't in the paper, but 
if it was something like this, who can be shuffled with whom? It's people can only be shuffled within their quartet or within their sextet uh, because the random allocation then here happened uh, after they were put into these quartets or sextets and then into the experimental conditions. Okay, so I think this is a good example of uh, the type of information that we would need to have if we were trying to reproduce this study and, and we don't have enough based on the method section. So I think this is really a call for us to think about um, using this process again to guide what we're writing. So in as a final reflection, I started out by saying that you should use simulation to do your inference and really this entire approach. So why, again, I think there's pedagogical value. Hopefully this approach is something that you thought was relatively easy to comprehend that when you're teaching your classes or you're advising your students, you would consider getting them to think about design diagrams and getting them to think about data generating processes and, and the null hypothesis in terms of a null data generating process. Because I think it, again, forces you to peel back the layers of that onion as opposed to just jumping to F distribution, ANOVA F test or F table. What I, I see at least in a lot of students, they don't really understand what the heck that is. And they're not able to adapt those methods to their designs. Hopefully you've seen today that this framework is robust and allows you to relatively intuitively tackle things like match pairs, assuming that we have the information or you know, complex block stratified randomization. So I think it has pedagogical value there. And then again, for the practical value, it forces you to be explicit about important study characteristics and explicitly links the design to the analysis. And that's really important that the, the part of the whole point of the ANOVA design is it, the analysis is based on the design, really. And so it's, it's making sure the design and analysis are married to each other. This, I think, forces that all to be explicitly stated in the open. And again, uh, it's a robust approach in terms of complexity and fewer assumptions. You don't have to deal with all that normality stuff. If you've used some random process, if you've used random assignment, you're good to go, basically. Um, so was this session as advertised? Uh, we advertised saying that I do five things. Um, specify a detailed design model. Uh, looking at the Jamboards, I think you were all able to do that. I'm pretty happy with what you were able to do. Um, certainly, if you have any questions about this idea, please feel free to reach out to me. This is not an idea that I made up. This is out there in the world. I think there's other people doing it, especially in the world of like causal inference. You see a lot of uh, DAGs or just design diagrams. It's that ethos. Let's map out what's actually happening. Uh, the second thing is identifying random sources of variation. So this is thinking about shuffling and who can be shuffled with whom, which is also tied with identifying and quantifying potential experimental sources of variation. And specifically here in terms of testing of a null hypothesis, the claim that the experimental source of variation is inconsequential. And that together with point two allows us the, uh, with the fact that we've used randomization in our design to then shuffle people, which feeds into four simulating results under this candidate model, which uh, we haven't practiced a lot of here together, but um, there's some R code that you have, the R markdown, uh, the file that I've provided, and I will continue building that as well. Again, if you do have any questions, please reach out to me. The mosaic package I think is phenomenal. The creators of that themselves have a lot of uh, learning materials out there to use mosaic, to do things like shuffling, as well as the other forms of simulation resampling like bootstrap resampling that I did not talk about at all today. And finally, I said that I, we would talk about drawing conclusions. Uh, I didn't really say anything new about this, but we've talked about how this process supports you drawing conclusions much in the same way as these uh, methods perhaps that you've used in the, in the traditionally uh, would allow you to do. And I think in peeling back the layers and thinking about the design, we can be more thoughtful about what actually evidence is included in being quantified in a p-value, let's just say, uh, and how we should interpret that as well. So hopefully you feel like uh, I've touched upon these things at least a little bit. Let me quickly own a bunch of things I didn't touch. Uh, I didn't touch repeated measures. I just said that the pretest scores were not repeated measures because they happened before randomization. Uh, this is a section in that R markdown file. Um, I, there's no data analysis, but at least talk about what we would do and give you some R code to do it. Essentially time becomes another factor in your model. Um, I didn't talk about two-way ANOVA at all, but I think that um, if you're thinking through who can be shuffled with whom and how randomization was employed, that the framework supports you in thinking about two-way ANOVA as well. And this is something that I plan to continue building out. 
Um, I didn't talk about measurement issues like ceiling or floor effects. So that normality assumption goes away, but measurement issues are still kind of a problem that we need to think about. And before you go and do any analyses, you should always be thinking about uh, the psychometric properties of whatever measures that you are using and make sure that you're constructing validity arguments that support your interpretation of these scores for your particular use. Uh, finally, uh, I didn't mim uh, talk about uh, random sampling at all. Uh, we would mimic it via bootstrap resampling. You can still use this basic uh, principle of drawing a design diagram. We kind of skipped and got a little lax on specifying a population of interest with inclusion and exclusion criteria, and then the uh, strategy with which people were sampled, but those would be essential components and really guide the simulation if we were trying to mimic random sampling. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of other things that I haven't talked about as well. But what did I talk about? It's this three-pronged approach. One last time, draw a study design diagram, tell the story of your study specify a hypothesized data generating process, make sure that your null hypothesis is specific enough to explain exactly what sources of variation are affecting individuals' responses to your main outcome and what are perhaps inconsequential sources of variation. And then go and enact simulation if you want to use a simulation-based approach to generating your sampling distribution. So thank you very much for spending the time with me here today. Again, I hope that you're walking away with something useful. Uh, you can connect with me on Twitter. My handle's RaoVNV or email me directly. Uh, I have a GitHub accounts where I do different trainings. There are different repositories and I'm trying to work on establishing a pages document or, or github.io pages. So uh, please do connect with me, reach out if you have any questions. And again, thank you very much for your time today. Thanks so much, Rao. It's absolutely amazing. That's been uh, really interesting. Thanks so much. Um, the video is going to be put online. Um, it'll take about an hour or two for it to process and stuff. So I'll be posting it on Twitter. Um, and, and next up, I think we've got a, an asynchronous session on Wednesday with Mark Lai. And um, until then, um, thanks very much. If anyone's got any questions now, please whack it in the chat. Otherwise, we'll be done. Bye now.